Hey, this is Dr. Ron Gary. I wanted to give an overview on some basic virology and talk a little bit about this coronavirus epidemic or pandemic that we're currently uh, uh, dealing with. And it's always important to start off with a joke. And so here is a husband and wife. If the coronavirus is so dangerous, the pilot wouldn't be flying. And that's our pilot. And obviously he's in uh, full protective uh, gear. And obviously the coronavirus is a, a very infectious virus and one we should all be uh, cautious about. So what is a virus? A virus is a microscopic organism that exists and it's almost everywhere in the earth. And it's a very uh, simplistic form in the sense that it uses your machinery to uh, replicate itself. Um, it can be associated with diseases, but it doesn't have to be associated with diseases. It could be either DNA or RNA. The DNA uh, viruses tend to be a little bit more stable, tend not to mutate as much as the RNA. DNA has some built-in uh, uh, checks to make sure that they're replicating uh, properly. RNA uh, doesn't, but some viruses have proofreaders in it, uh, like the coronavirus does have a proofreader, so it tends to be a little bit more of a stable RNA viruses as opposed to those that don't. It has it's surrounded by a coat of proteins um, and some glycoproteins. They're basically everywhere on Earth, and we've all been exposed to viruses. Most of us have had coronaviruses and uh, infections in the past, but also rabies, herpes, Ebola, SARS, MARS are all different type of uh, uh, viruses, as well as the common cold, as well as influenza, you know, the common flu that we all get. And when we think about a virus, they have these glycoproteins um, on the outside, which a lot of times bind to the receptors. Um, then they have the envelope, which tends to protect it. And this can be a way for us to attack the virus as well um, um, by going after the envelope. And then it tends to have uh, the capsid, which protects the uh, DNA, the genetic material, or the RNA, depending on what type of virus it is. When we think about the life cycle of a virus, uh, this here is the virus. It binds to a receptor, and a receptor could be uh, any different things from an ACE receptor or a DDP uh, receptor. Um, all our cells have receptors. It binds onto the receptors. It gets internalized. It breaks off from the receptor, and then the virus particle breaks up into its genetic makeup, the DNA or the RNA, and then its uh, proteins. It then uses our our body's mechanism, our body's mechanics to replicate itself. So it'll replicate the proteins using our host ribosomes, and then it uses our machinery to replicate its uh, DNA or RNA, and then it reassembles, and then it uh, comes out of the cell and it releases more that came in, and these go off to infect uh, other cells. And this is basically the life cycle of uh, pretty much every virus. So this is the uh, SARS coronavirus and it binded to the uh, ACE2 uh, receptor, which is a common receptor. We use it to treat blood pressure and hypertension, um, heart failure. Um, and so you really can't block this receptor because we need it. Um, and that's what makes viruses so difficult is that they're very simple, only four or five parts, and then they use our own uh, mechanisms. Um, how I got involved in virology uh, was I used to study a uh, an algae called uh, Oreococcus anaphangefrens, which is an algae that causes the brown tide, which is very similar to um, the red tide, which we get blooms down here in Florida. And there would be 10 million uh, of the algae per ml, and the next day it was begun. And when I was sitting in microbiology course, it got dawned on me, you know, how could it disappear overnight? And I started to think that maybe it could be a virus that was causing it. And it led us to discover this uh, virus, which is Oreococcus anaphagefrens viral 1, which is a phage, but unlike most phages, it's a DNA. And then we sequenced the uh, protein um, of it um, and really launched the whole field of uh, marine virology. Um, but viruses are basically everywhere. The same thing was done with COVID-19, and it was done in record time. We basically were able to uh, synthesize the genetic makeup and its proteins, you know, within months, which is just unheard of. This is something that used to take years. Um, and so we really were on top of this virus from the very beginning. When we look at uh, infections, you have these mild or asymptomatic carriers, and these are the people who really spread the virus because they're really not sick. And then you have the people who get really sick who tend to be hospitalized, and then you have the 
people who die from the infection. And obviously this is a, a degradation where you have some people here who are showing some symptoms and are at home and then some people here are hospitalized uh, for it. But this is the natural history of most uh, viral uh, infections. So when we look at the coronavirus, it appears that it started sometime in early uh, December um, when we had the first cases. And obviously early on, people were saying that um, it was an infection. I think the World Health Organization came out and said it wasn't infectious. Some of the physicians who were involved were saying that it was, um, and they were quite concerned about it. And maybe there was some disinformation early on, but you could just see how rapidly this uh, took off um, in China into January. And then obviously now it's progressed throughout the whole world. So this is on February 21st. You could see Asia is really affected by it. At this point in time, the U.S. had very few cases. Most of them were up in uh, Wash the state of Washington. Canada had very few infections. Um, Europe was just starting to have uh, uh, issues. And then you look at it, um, this is in mid-March, and you can see almost all of America has had it. Europe is inundated with it. Italy is loaded with it. And Asia is starting to, to, to settle down. And so obviously this is what we call pandemic, where something spread so rapidly, well, way over 400,000 cases at this point. Uh, uh, point in time. So what are the symptoms of a coronavirus? The fever tends to be higher than the flu. We say above 103. Obviously, I've seen patients whose uh, fever has been less. Some have not had fevers. But the fever tends to be a striking feature. But it's all these symptoms. It's usually associated with a dry cough, right? So they're not bringing up any uh, phlegm. And then they also tend to have some a feeling of shortness of uh, breath. And somewhere between a third to half the people may have diarrhea. There's some incidents that maybe there's some conjunctivitis um, that we're seeing with it. You tend not to get the sore throat and a headache like you do with influenza, um, but again, you can. And the myalgias and arthralgias can be present, but tend not to be as striking as you see in influenza. But again, you know, this is just general guidelines, and uh, it's varying from person to uh, person. When we look at the total deaths, it's basically now become logarithmic, um, where the amount of deaths is just increasing uh, dramatically. Um, some reports out of Italy are 700 people dying in a 24-hour period. Um, and it seems, seems to be that the elderly are more vulnerable uh, uh, to this, but definitely people who have comorbid uh, conditions, other issues, diabetes, hypertension, heart failure, uh, emphysema, asthma, those type of uh, uh, comorbid conditions. As far as vaccines, they're not going to be here for this pandemic. Um, they're going to be there to prevent this from ever happening again. They're probably 12 months away. These are all the different vaccine trials that are going on. And you can see there's a whole bunch of them. Um, but again, this probably is 12 months away at this point in time. When we talk about medications, the two big ones are uh, remdesivir, um, which tends to be broadly against viruses who have genetic material that is RNA. Again, there's only preliminary data, and these studies are ongoing. We don't know if it's going to work. And then chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine, and the studies are underway. Um, they're doing this with azithromycin in New York City. If I had somebody who was critical at Yale, I'd probably put them on chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. Um, you know, if they're that sick, I don't think you're going to do any harm, and there's a possibility of doing some benefit. The FDA has also approved uh, plasma from, from survivors, and this is quite interesting. So somebody who had the coronavirus, who got over it, has developed antibodies to the infection, and you could take those antibodies and you could give it to somebody else to help them fight the infection. Um, and this may be something, it's limited in that you have to develop the plasma from somebody who has gone in it and then do it, but for somebody who's critically ill, this may be life-saving. So what can we do? You need to stay at home, except for if you're going to get medical care, and you really need to stay at home. You will not get it if you're ho home not exposed to anybody. Separate yourself from others, especially during the incubation period. If you think you're sick with a cough, shortness of breath, fever, call your doctor's office and let them know. And if they want to see you, they'll tell you what to do. Most of the time, we just leave a mask out. And when you come into the office, you put a mask on before you come in. Uh, most of us have signs on our office telling people what to do if we enter the office. Uh, wear a mask if you're sick. The mask really should be for people who are sick so they stop spreading it rather than for the rest of the people who don't have it. Um, you know, there has been a shortage of the N95 mask. Uh, cover your cough and sneeze with your elbow. Uh, keep your hands really clean. Um, 
and avoid sharing personal items. Clean all high touch surfaces, you know, with disinfectant. This includes remotes, light switches, door handles, your car uh, steering wheel, uh, your car doors, um, you know, monitor your symptoms. And then the CDC has an excellent article about when to discontinue home isolations um, if your symptoms are resolved, if you were uh, Corona uh, 19 positive. We want to wash our hands and again it's real important you wash both sides of your hands you want to go in between your fingers use your uh, paper towel to turn off the faucets and they say 20 seconds to wash your hands is really the most effective way to do this um, in summary let's be cautious if you're sick stay home and i really mean that stay home cover your mouth wash your hands avoid those who are sick and keep yourself healthy and with that I'll share a picture of a sunrise over Marco Island uh, one morning coming into work. Um, everybody be safe, and I appreciate you watching this.